Hello, this is Cynthia Mazzaferro with Powerful Beyond Measure, and I am so excited to have another fabulous author. Her name is Patricia Noel. Hi, Patricia, how are you? Hi, Cynthia, I'm great, thanks. Great, well, let me tell you a little bit about, more about Patricia. She's a televised self-esteem expert, speaker and author of Good With Me, a simple approach to real happiness from the inside out. She is a licensed mental health counselor, certified addictions professional, and an acupuncturist physician, and founder of Focus One, which is an outpatient substance abuse treatment program, which is licensed in the state of Florida. She has been working over 30 years, helping thousands of troubled individuals from all walks of life discover the secret to real happiness from the inside out. Um, she knows firsthand that being good with me and happy for real is easier than you think. So we're going to be talking a lot about happiness today, and that's one of my favorite topics. So welcome and thank you, Patricia, for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure. Oh, great. Um, so Patricia, I'd love to ask my authors what compelled them to write their book. So can you share a little bit about that story? Sure. I think I've been writing it in my head for a lot of years before I actually put it to, to paper and, and pen and what have you. And it really came about because once a year, I have someone come in from the state of Florida, takes a look at what I'm doing, what my clients are having to say, and kept saying, oh my gosh, no one else is addressing this. You have got to say something about this. You've got to get it out. So for year after year, she kept nudging me. And finally, I said, okay, I'm doing it. And that's really it. And, and beyond that, it was that I want to reach way more individuals than I am in my private practice. Mm -hmm. and so that's a start. Great, great. And I love the title. Do you have a, co a copy of your book right there so you can show everyone? I do. I do. Yay. Yay. Bring it up a little bit more. Good with me. And there it is, a little stick figure with a happy smile. And um, that's great. Have you always been a happy person or did you also have some personal struggles that you had oh, too? Oh gosh, I wish I had always been a happy person. <laughs> the reason I know this and what it does is because it was my own personal journey. That's uh, always so true. We always write books that we've actually lived our and experienced ourselves, and we need to then get that message out. It's so true. Absolutely. And I think once we know that it works, and if it works for us, then it can work for others. I've always said, gosh, if, if it would work for me, I was someone with zero self-esteem. Right. I, I wasn't even sure it was zero. <laughs> that was that much. <laughs> well, you know, and self-esteem is the one aspect of your book, and we'll be getting into that shortly, um, which you really felt was a very key component. And most of the people that know me, I always talk about we all have our own individual crux or our, our wounding or a thing that we need to grow and experience. And for you, it was self-esteem that was really holding you back from experiencing happiness in your life, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think it's pretty universal. I think I'm not the only one, you know, I wasn't happy. And so I was dependent upon someone or something outside of me for happiness. And it's so short lived, yeah. you know, it well, isn't. Let's break that down a little bit. So define what self-esteem is for you. For me, it's knowing and recognizing that I have value and worth, which are kind of the same thing from the inside out because I'm alive and I exist. Not because of what I have, what I know, what I do, who I know, the degree. And what others think about you. And That's has nothing extreme. to do with what, yes, thank you for that. Has nothing to do with what other people think of, of us. Right. And yet, when we don't have self-esteem, that's the number one biggest worry. It's well, you know, and I think that self-esteem is an aspect um, that's very important because self-esteem brings us strength in our um, ability to trust ourselves, to believe that we have the independence and the strength to, to overcome obstacles, to um, take that leap of faith, to push through on new avenues that you're going to explore. But um, 
you know, and everyone, some people have really strong um, self-esteem, feeling they're confident, feeling they're an extrovert, feeling their capacity, but that doesn't mean they experience happiness. So even though they're both important to solidifying and, and stepping into your own creative self, your own spiritual self, they too um, are really two different, for me, two different aspects that allows us um, to really find that peace and happiness and joy in our, in our lives. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think what I do with, with Good With Me and with the work that I do is I have separated self-esteem from what I call other dependent esteem. And I, my experience has been with working with thousands and thousands of people is that society is teaching other dependent esteem and then wondering why no one is happy. Mm -hmm. we're, we're teaching that it is someone or something out there that's going to make us happy. So and, let's, can you and, explain a little bit more about this other dependent esteem? Sure, sure. Because it, a lot of what Good With Me is about is identifying the difference between the two. The, the concept that there are actually two esteems there's the self-dependent, which comes from the inside out, as I just described. I don't, I don't have to do anything for that one. It's just because I'm alive and I have value because I'm alive. The other dependent esteem is about what society says, well, if you don't do this or you don't have these goals and accomplish them, then you don't get to have any esteem. And so, you know, we're, we're taught that that's where our esteem is going to come from and that's going to make us happy and we're going to feel good about ourselves. Great. And how many of us have done all of that? I know I did. I, I was successful. I did everything that I was supposed to do thinking, wow, this is, this is the answer. And I still felt empty. Mm -hmm. And I right. we're always looking for reinforcements. We want that perfect grade on the test. We want that promotion. Mm -hmm. We want the verbal praise. Um, you yeah, we want someone to tell us we're lovely and beautiful because we don't necessarily feel we're beautiful inside. So we're always looking for the external confirmation in whatever form it might take um, to validate, to confirm um, our true existence, really. Um, sure. So we're allowing the world to judge our worth. And it is so inappropriately well placed, said. as you said. Well said. Well said. Yes, we are. We're allowing others to define us. And what I refer to in my book, Powerful Beyond Measure, is that you are then given them, the external world, power over you. Absolutely. How you view yourself, how you view is um, success for you, how you view what you can do, even your future, what your expectations are, because the world can be so self-limiting um, in that we allow that power, their power to control us. We cannot sometimes breathe. We cannot move. We cannot flourish. We cannot experience pure happiness and joy because um, we allow the world to control that. And I, I think the most important part is we individually allow that to happen. So once we claim that power back, which is what I talk about, this power within, and I know you talk about this self-esteem, believing in just your own essence and your own place, yes. that's all that you need. You don't need the external um, aspect to mm -hmm. define you. Right. And, and so with that being said, I, my experience is it's an inside job, and I think that's what you're saying as well. Sure. You know, and we may use different words to describe it. The power within is when, when we value ourselves, there's power in that. Yes. And that's the power within. And I, I so agree that we've been taught to give it away. And, right. and then what do we do with that? We've become very good at faking that we are confident, that we are happy that we have esteem i have people tell me every day oh i have plenty of esteem and i already know that they don't because i can just by the words by the you know the demeanor there are so many telltale signs that it isn't present and yet we really believe oftentimes that we have it because that's what we've been taught that it, it is I, it is and i think it's a very um 
I think esteem is a very difficult word because for most people, just like power, uh, for most people, power thinks, oh, I'm very strong and I can muscle through anything. That's not necessarily power. Just like esteem is like someone that you hold up in high esteem. You know, it's like putting yourself up higher than others. And that's not esteem. Again, I think our definitions of words have been cut some um, so contrite and so inaccurate um, that we don't understand what it means to value. That doesn't mean egotistically, being narcissistic. That no. means about seeing the beautiful self that you are, the spirit that you are. And um, when you can start to reside in that space from the inside out, like you also mm -hmm. say, and I do too, mm -hmm. it's, it's good with me. And I love the title because it's, it's very complex but very simple it's it makes yes. you ponder and think about it which i love <laughs> but it's like being content with yourself is allowing you to find inner peace and we all need that so much today oh my goodness yes we do and i think you know what you were talking about you know the arrogance or the bravado you know and and hurting other people with it that is just a manifestation of the lack of real self-esteem and other dependent esteem. It's a smokescreen for, I don't want you to see what I see inside of me. So look at how good I am and how great I do this or whatever. And I have said for quite some time and that we can be confident in something that we know or that we do maybe a skill or a job because we've been told we have to have those skills in order to be good enough and so we can have lots of confidence in that however what I maintain is confidence without that inner piece of self-esteem equals feeling phony on the inside and therefore a lot of bravado look how good I am yeah or the opposite of that, let's hide and be invisible and don't notice me, please. Exactly, we wear a mask. I mean, how mm -hmm. often have people asked you, how do you feel today? Now, regardless of how you truly feel, you either, even if you're elated, let's say something fabulous happens, you're sure. not going to necessarily tell the person because it'll come across bragging. Likewise, if you're feeling <laughs> disappointed, frustrated, grieving, whatever the word might be, you're not going to complain and let people know how you truly feel. And I think in today's world, more than ever, we see so much mental and emotional um, illnesses and abuse that we are not transparent to ourselves. We are not being truthful and we're not being truthful to the world. And hence, there is so much um, dismay and the illnesses and the shootings that we see and the addictions and codependencies. I mean, it's just so rampant in our lives. Yes, and I'm so glad you brought that up because it's just been so in, in my uh, mind and that I, I really see that the lack of esteem is at the foundation, at the root of the school shootings, for example. If we, if we really inspect it, we're saying mental illness, but really... Is it an illness or is it something that we haven't been trained to identify and pay much attention to? We don't pay much attention to how we see ourselves. You know, it's all what's outer and what we show on the outside. And I have seen so often in my, in my private practice with clients is that if I don't esteem myself, from the inside out and I don't think anyone else esteems me from the outside in in other words I don't think they like me I might be weird I don't fit in and belong mm -hmm. that is the breeding ground for anger mm. and that anger just festers and festers and festers and at some point it doesn't take much for it to either explode or implode. Exactly. Yeah, oh, exactly. And, and well, all those accounts. Yeah. Well, and I tend to think it's more, um, not so much the mental illness that is really the initial onset. If you, I think it's more emotional 
um, unrest. You know, I think that we're, you know, we're taught as a very young child, if someone's having a temper tantrum or they're crying, don't cry. You know, we don't want to hear what you have to say. And to negate someone's feelings um, is really just saying, I don't, you're not important. I don't need to hear you. And, and that's what we're teaching, unfortunately, our young children. And, and we don't have parenting classes. We don't tell and teach our parents who are so important in the role modeling and the upbringing because they're also suffering from their own emotional yes. wounds, if you will. And we can't teach something that we don't own. Exactly. How can we role model that? Exactly. Exactly. So you're so, I agree with you so totally that children aren't getting that esteem piece, right. that feeling good about themselves. You know, I tell this story so often and it just means so much to me. Um, when I was little, I, I just grew up really dirt poor and out in the country and it was a really big deal in the summertime to drive a ways, I don't even know how far it was, to the nearest ice cream stand. And we'd get dressed up. I remember I had this little pink dress with a little white collar on it. And my mother would always say to me, don't you get that ice cream on your dress. Oh, so much for having a wonderful but outing. What? I always did. And she was always upset with me. And you know what I learned immediately was I have to be a certain way in order for my mother to like me. Right. And I think that's my story. There are just millions of stories. Each one has mm. our own little story. Oh, exactly. Thank you for and, sharing that. And it's such a simple story. I think people think you have to be sexually molested or, or beaten, physically beaten to be have been affected. No, for me, everybody's probably heard my story, unless you're new to me. Mine was my parents got divorced when I was seven. For me, it was about abandonment. My father walked out of our lives. And I was always looking for that external verbal, especially from a man, confirming me, which I didn't have. Sure. But, you know, it's just we all have a history, a past mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. continues to impact us even today if we're not conscious of that particular emotional wounding that has kind of like laid its fossil. You know, you've laid your imprint internally. It's yeah. fossilized. And that energy, that emotion is there fueling, like you said, that volcano. It can erupt or it can implode inside or it can come out in anger and verbal or physical altercations. And it's so important that we need to find this inner harmony, which I think we both talk about. And inner harmony is, is a place of peace, self-acceptance, the self-esteem that you see yourself as important, irregardless of what others see. And you know, one of my oldest sons said to me just recently, you know, he's 32 and he said, you know, Hey, I'm okay. Everyone doesn't have to love me. And that's okay. So oh, I was like, wow. <laughs> I love to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's okay because we don't need everyone to love us. And it's okay. Yes. And also, we don't have to be perfect. And I think people think when you talk about esteem, well, if I fail on that diet, if I didn't get the promotion, if I, I don't know, argued or yelled at the kids and were disrespectful to them, you know, I'm not perfect. But we can try to recognize our, our fallities, our imperfections, and say, how can I respond differently in the future? How can I like what I'm doing better? Not because the world sees it wrong, but because I choose to want to see myself better. Absolutely. And shift the way that we see that in our mind's eye, mm. that we aren't failing and those aren't really mistakes. We're just learning how to do it better. And or different. Then, yeah, or different. Um, and better doesn't mean perfect. You know, I think practice makes better, not perfect. And if we can just allow that, you know, there's a, if I can, if I can share this with you, I love this story mm -hmm. and I think it explains exactly what we're talking about. Great. You know who Ted Turner is, the, sure. the founder of CNN, and um, he loves running racing his sailboat in the big uh, america's cup every year and he only won one time through all the years that he's raced mm -hmm. and so he was being interviewed by one of his reporters and the reporter just really put him on the spot and said well ted how did it feel losing all those years and ted's response was 
I wasn't lear- losing. I was just learning how to win. Wonderful. Right? But I don't even think winning right. is actually what the goal is. Sailing, the camaraderie, perfecting, doing mm-hmm. the, the trek of sailing, you know, perfecting mm-hmm. competition. You know, I think so often we get stuck with a finite destination, you know, whether it's the promotion, whether it's the winning the race, um, losing 25 pounds. If you've lost 23, right. then you haven't met your goal. And we get so stuck on a finite destination, the finishing line, we're, we're actually seeing all the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Miss that finishing line by a hundredth of a second and come in fourth. Right. Does that mean right. you're a loser? No, not by right. any means. Right. You know? And I think that if we can start to shift, like I love that word shift because it is a shift in our mentality and understanding of how we participate in life that we can choose to participate in the journey. You know, we've heard the word journey and the, mm-hmm. in the path that we're on and growing from there. And it's not the final outcome. My mentor who wrote my um, forward to my book, Marcy Shema, a happiness expert internationally, written mm-hmm. many happiness books and including mm-hmm. Chicken Soap for the Women's Soul. Mm-hmm. She came to me one day when we were driving to her house and she goes, so Cindy, you're always so goal driven. You know, you, you do your task and you, you get it done. And it's like, okay, what's next? And she goes, sometimes you're so goal driven. You actually miss the fun and the pleasure of the journey yes. to that end point, whatever it is. And I, and I've chosen to look at things differently. I, I you know, it's, mm-hmm. um, and I think we can all benefit from that. And it really has nothing about self-esteem. It's more about, um, finding enjoyment in ourselves, in our journey, in, in our growing potential um, of expansiveness and, and not seeing ourselves as limiting in any way, whether our results are different than what we initially envisioned. Do you agree with that? I do. And I think that is, is esteem. If I esteem myself, if I like myself, I like you. Mm-hmm. If I accept myself, I accept you. And I can have fun in life, in everything that I do, rather than be so stressed to the max, am I doing it right? Do they like me? Uh, do they think I'm okay? You know, that chatter that just keeps going on. Is this okay? Is this all right? Am I good enough? What do they think? And we can just relax and we can enjoy and be content and have fun. It totally changes our experience of life. I I love that. And, you know, we talked about children before and parents. And I think that as parents, it's really important. It doesn't mean you should idolize or tell them, oh, my gosh, you're a masterpiece or you're, you know, let them see their brilliance. Encourage you to show ways as parenting that they get to see, wow, I did a great job at even striking out at the baseball game. You know, it was great diligence. I was focused. Um, My eye-hand coordination was there. But, hey, he had a great pitch, and I didn't make it. But the point is, is we have to stop trying to always um, infuse other people of what we do. (laughs) I I love that. I I think it's so important. And and these messages that we uh, bring to people with authors, I just love it because we all have different ways of saying things, different um, aspects. And, and your message is, is wonderful, Patricia. I love it. And I know other people are connecting with it. So you discovered a unique approach to this real happiness that's changed lives. Can you tell us a little bit more if there's anything more that needs to be added to it from what we've talked about already that goes into that? Yes, you mentioned uh, a very significant, you used a very significant word a little bit ago, and I kind of like grabbed onto it when so you I said gotta come back to this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's consciousness. And we have to wake up and become conscious and quit sleepwalking on autopilot through life unconsciously and, and realize and monitor what we are thinking. Most people don't even know that they're responsible for the chatter that's going on in their heads. And yet that's their thinking process. Maybe they answer themselves and it sounds like there's a couple people up there. However, we're doing that, and that is what the thinking that we do creates the way we feel, especially if we start with the way that we think about ourselves. How often do we say, oh, I was such an idiot. That was so stupid. Dummy, I can't believe you did that. You know, that chatter is going on, 
And then that creates the way we feel about who we are. And so I, I just love the word conscious. And that's what I think we have to first of all do is wake up and say, what am I thinking? What am I thinking? So that we can start to change it if we don't like it. Right. If it doesn't benefit us. You know, it's kind of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg, you know? If we initially started with a more peaceful, healthier inner self, of self-esteem, of what we feel and see in ourselves, we wouldn't have that negative chatter. Sure. But because our mind is a uh, resource, it's a uh, memory bank of everything in the past, mm -hmm. it reminds us of all the times we failed, all the times we've hurt, and it wants to protect us. It says, oh, remember when that happened? Remember when your mom said that about your ice cream in the dress? You know, you keep remembering that. It's like you have to tiptoe. You have to... You have to um, your brain wants to protect you from experiencing pain or failure or hurt or anger, or whatever. And so this chatter, like you're talking about, is always constantly going on. It, it's just truly amazing. So as we, in the present moment, which is only when you can really affect consciousness, you realize that you're hearing this and say, I've got to stop this record. I've got to stop this replaying. And that's a conscious act that you can do from moment to moment. And as you get better at this, and I know for myself at least, I've gotten better, not perfect, that I can be more in a homeostasis state of being, of respite, of calmness, what I call my inner sanctuary of peacefulness. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. But when you can reside in that place more, there's less of that mental chatter going on. Yes, and if we, if we go a step further with that, I see, you know, when I tell my ice cream story, I have no energy attached to that anymore. Right. It's just a story, you know, whereas prior years, there was so much energy attached to that. I'm not good enough. I'm not this, you know, whatever. Right. And so I think that's part of that process of, of shifting from the negative thinking that we do about ourselves to the positive thinking. And when we look at the discovery of the science of neuroplasticity, which is so exciting to me because it actually proves that we can teach an old dog new tricks and that we can shift from the negative to the positive because the brain will grow new neural pathways. Exactly. Dendrites, right? And the more we practice, the stronger they become. And so what we're doing eventually is we're resetting our default on our computer. So if somebody says, oh, you know, I don't like that shirt you're wearing. It's a horrible color for you. <laughs> we go, oh, well, okay. You know, I like it. And I don't have to default to, oh, no, I made the wrong choice. What's wrong with me? Why didn't I know better? You know, I can say, oh, well, that's okay. Like your son said, everybody doesn't have to love me. I'm okay. Yeah. And just to be satisfied, yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, it is. It's a default, and I, I love that. And for some people, that word default is confusing because they think a computer. It's kind of like what, what you normally revert back to. I like to think of it as you've, you've ridden this road for your whole lifetime about worrying about how people think. And so by this neuroplasticity we're talking about, about creating new pathways, you're actually laying down a new bedrock, a new road that you're going to traverse from A to B. And it's going to give you better results, feeling more happy on the journey, going to the ice cream store, looking forward to it. doesn't matter if the ice cream spills or not, right. it's right. going to be fun. Exactly. You know, so a journey, a joining um, this new road that you're laying the conscious networking, the kind of, um, the yes. change in attitude, mentality, action, lack of action. Sometimes it's, our action is, Yelling and screaming. So in that case, maybe lack of action. I'm going to retreat and walk out of the room because I choose to, not because I'm a failure, not because I don't want to, um, but we have a choice how to respond, how to think, how to move, how to feel. And all of these things are all that you're, you know, capable for you to totally change your life and be happy. Right. And, and one of the things that I, I also find, and I'm sure that you'll agree with me, is that so many people aren't happy because they don't know the steps to take. They don't know how to, to be happy. It's part of what we don't know we don't know. 
Great. And so when we don't know what we don't know, we don't know how to address it or how to find the answers because we don't even know what to ask for. Great. So when we can get this information out so that people can say, oh, that's it. Okay, it isn't, there isn't anything wrong with me. I just didn't have this piece of information. I didn't and I think people are afraid because they don't want to take ownership for their failures or their perceived failures or right. their perceived sadness. They don't want to blame it on themselves. And there's no blaming. It's understanding. Right. It's the other way. It's realizing I can change the way I feel about this or the way I respond to it. It's not a feeling or a success. It's about taking ownership of your captain of the ship, your ship, your vessel, your body, and you get to control all that. And that's an amazing process. That's powerful. And um, when you can step in your own power of construction of how you want to live your life, that's a, an amazing place to be. That's where the power is that you're talking about. Yeah. That inner power. That, wow, okay, I got this. I can do it. I'm responsible for me. Not, not blaming again. It isn't my fault. It's just now I know how to be responsible and I can do that without right. being wrong. And I love your work because you deal with addictions and, um, yes. and you know, it's so powerful to see a, a medical doctor um, really use these inner workings of self to find that to be the solution to their healing, not just, you know, use a nicotine patch or, you know, you have oh, to give up. Yes alcohol all the way or drugs or whatever that the co-addiction is sex i mean there's so many gambling you know we're always looking for this false happiness mode to um numb ourselves and umb numb ourselves um and just to dissolve away from feeling those emotions pain grief loss whatever the words are Yes, thank you for bringing that up because I think we all want to feel good. I haven't met anyone on the planet yet who doesn't want to feel good. And yet we haven't been taught how to make ourselves feel good just by changing our thinking about ourselves and, and, a lot, and some other things that would follow. And so my definition of addiction is being dependent upon someone or something outside of myself to make me feel good. Right. or at least a little bit better, right. right? And for many, being numb feels better than feeling. Right. I will say I did have one client who had been sexually abused all her life, had cancer multiple times, um, had distanced herself from family members, and she never actually was ever hugged by her mother or stepfather who abused her. But when we, and she had fibromyalgia, she had a lot of physical symptoms that came out because of her unrest inside, um, mm -hmm. which is what I also do with energy work. Um, but part of when she resolved a lot of her physical symptoms, she did not know how to live in a happy place. Because for her, homeostasis, normal, was a unhappy place. So, yes. it, it, you know, it is true. You might want something different. You might want something happier. Mm -hmm. But that people don't know how to exist, how to be comfortable, or maybe feel they're worthy of feeling happy in a different place. And that also is a conscious decision. You have to choose to, again, lay that roadwork to allow you to amp up, allow yourself to lift yourself up to experiencing happiness and joy and love in your life. It doesn't, it's not, it's not a light switch, as you know. Right, right. And, and two, I think, you know, today, in this day and time, we have an epidemic of alcoholism, of drug use, of just about any kind of addictive behavior you can think of. Mm -hmm. And I see that a lot of that is, is, has increased since the onset of the World Wide Web, you know, the internet, where we can start to compare ourselves to everyone else and then make up a story about how much better they are than we are. And we buy that story and we believe it. And so we, we put ourselves down as a result in, instead of looking at what is really real here. This is amazing. And it's so exciting. I know you've seen other people too doing work similar to us. And, you know, it's all of us really 
growing from within our own selves that we've, you know, we're not perfect. We all had our own stories to, to work from and grow from. And, and once you realize that this is your, what I refer to as your spiritual book, this is your spiritual growth opportunity. Instead of looking at, oh, poor me, or, oh my God, my life's so terrible. This is your wonderful opportunity to grow. And I love Patricia's book. She offers so many wonderful ways to really help you improve your, your inner self-esteem and um, growing that is just an amazing process. And I know we both really encourage all of us and, and you, those here on listening to this video to really, you know, reach out to be with positive people. Um, because when you're with positive people, you're going to, it's infectious. You know, you grow within yourself too. And um, like any farmer, you have to have the right environment to grow whatever you're trying to grow. So, um, but we have to do our own parts. And I, I really thank you for your work, um, the years and years of service and all the people that you've helped. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Yeah. So why don't you show us your book again, let people know where they can find it. I think they can even read your first chapter on your website. Am I right? They can. They can read it on my website, goodwithme.com. They can look at some of the chapters on Amazon. They, you know, will give you that opportunity to do some of that. Uh, it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the indie bookstores. And uh, I just invite people to, to check it out because the things that are going on in your life that you're not happy with are the symptoms they're of the problem. They're not the real problem, even though they seem to cause lots of problems. Right. right. And I just think it's a wonderful parenting tool because if you're a parent, you notice the picture on the, the book is a stick figure. It's, it's how we need to start teaching our children when they're drawing stick figures. Um, you know, are they happy? Do they have a happy smile? Do they have all their appendages? You know, how do they see themselves in the world? And this is the building of the self-esteem. So using her chapters, Patricia's chapters and the content can help you also be a better parent in increasing your child's self-esteem. So I think it's a book that we all can use. And um, I, I really encourage you all to go out and, and get yourself a copy and buy one for a friend. So thank you very much, Patricia, for having me, um, having you on my show. I love um, connecting with so many, and thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, thank you, listeners and viewers. So happy to have you again in my life. Um, you continue to bless my life, and thank you for that. Um, remember to check out Powerful Beyond Measure as well, and have a beautiful day. And remember to reach for the stars. You are as brilliant as that. Take care.